that's another intriguing part about the human psyche because we love to live in illusions more than reality yeah that's true but that's called the uh goal of the enlightenment to get people out that every one of us gets out of the easy way huh? not to think just to follow others and just to make themselves speak up and then we haven't reached the enlightenment we are still in the middle ages on seekers mind talks today our guest is dr gerd gigeranser he's a renowned psychologist and the director of center of adaptive behavior and cognition at the max planck institute in berlin he is known for his groundbreaking research on how humans make decisions under uncertainty he proposes that it's better to rely on simple heuristics rather than complex models is a author of numerous books including best sellers like gut feeling and risk savvy which looks deep into human intuitions how we make decisions every day and how to challenge conventional thinking and much more i'm your host raj and enjoy the conversation with gerd on the seekers mind talks so you have a great picture a wall behind you oh Looks thank like you tree of life yes it is and uh, there are many uh, old sagas which do have tree of lives for instance mm-hmm. the nibelungen saga has a, mm-hmm. a tree of life which is um, basically where everything was born and lived and uh, also its enemies like the big snake is gnawing on the roots mm. you, you what i love, love about the tree of life is that it's connected to all the elements at all points mm-hmm. you're rooted and you grow and <clears throat> yeah and i f- i find that really enlightening mm-hmm. And there are, uh, for instance, uh, there is the the saga about Wotan, so mm-hmm. the Nordic Zeus, mm-hmm. who uh, cut a branch from the tree of life to make a spear, and that cost him his eye. Oh, mm-hmm. there are so many stories. Uh... I think the tree of life exists in more than one traditions, right? Mm. It's it's represented in more, and that's why I think it's it's of its importance mm. because it survived yeah. the test of time. Mm. Do do you feel that you entered like the last the last quarter of your life, or <laughs> are you still <laughs> young, in, in inside at least? <laughs> uh, inside, I think uh, you're always young. Mm. Uh huh. Mm. <laughs> without uncertainty your life will not be disappointing it will not have surprises uncertainty is one of the main characteristics of life without it life would be empty so a risky life or an uncertain life or a predictable life mm. yeah what oh. would you choose <clears throat> so the uh, without uncertainty there would be no intelligence there would be no need to know anything because everything would be certain and life would be as interesting as reading the newspaper of last year mm. basically yes. boring yes and without uncertainty we wouldn't need emotions we wouldn't need to trust someone and there would be no surprises and the first kiss the first marriage the first child born would be as boring as anything else. because everything is certain and you would know when you die hmm. and another 
prospectus that you put forward is risk versus uncertainty. So should one lead a risk, risky life or an uncertain life? What's the difference there? <laughs> so the term risk versus uncertainty uh, or the distinction between risk and uncertainty is a fundamental one. And it is so important, has been emphasized by economists like Frank Knight, the founder of the Chicago School, uh, or uh, John Maynard Keynes, or Herbert Simon, and has been suppressed and, or ignored by mainstream neoclassical economics and also by mainstream decision theory. A, a situation of risk is defined as one where you know the complete set of possible future states of the world, everything that can happen, and also all of their consequences, and also their probability distributions. So if you yeah, play a roulette in a casino, that's a situation of risk. You know everything that can happen, no surprises. It's a number between zero and 36. Nothing else can happen. And uh, interesting is that the dominant uh, decision theory is about risk or about ambiguity. That means the same situation, you know the complete state space, but you don't know mm. the probabilities. Mm. And uncertainty means that things can happen, you never expect it. Or like a war, or a, a financial crisis of 2008. And uh, the important thing is that the tools people have for dealing with risk are different from those with dealing with uncertainty. So that's the that's the basic decision. And the my heart has always been in studying how people make decisions under uncertainty, where you mm. can optimize. And that's the big thing. You, know, you can't use the standard math in this. You need a different math. For instance, the mathematics of heuristics. And... Uh, <clears throat> It is still the case that even those who criticize, say, uh, neo-economic theory, that is expected utility, maximization, the subjective or the objective way, they still believe in it as what one should do. And then if people do something different, the blame is on the human mind, on the people, and hmm. almost never on the theory. Do, do you think a lot of science is getting lost because of this mainstream decision theory? Yeah, it's a. So I've worked with uh, Reinhard Selten and published a book. He is the only German Nobel laureate in economics. And people like him, they think about game theory or expected utility maximization as an interesting mathematical problem but they don't confuse it with decision-making mm. in the real world. Mm. And people like uh, Richard Thaler, Danny Kahneman, they confuse it. They think mm. that you should always follow logical rationality in every situation. And but life is so unpredictable. You can never know all the variables. No, in most situations, there are a few that are like okay. risk or ambiguity, but many are like uncertainty. Hmm. I, was, I was reading through Twitter posts and I saw that a lot of your followers were saying like you're lost, your work got lost under Kahneman's work. Have you ever thought like that? What? No, I don't think it got lost. Yeah, <laughs> It is clear that in the U.S., uh -huh. It is the Kahneman Tversky perspective is still the dominant one. Mm -hmm. But more and more people have been aware 
about the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I've been aware that heuristics, which are the tools to deal with uncertainty, are not second best. Mm -hmm. More people become aware that the entire optimization or maximization of expected utility is useless in the real world. Mm -hmm. right. And that's not that this is, uh, I'm not the first one who is saying that. I may be the first one who developed an alternative to the study mm. of ecological rationality, of heuristics, but the fact that uh, this, the theory of subjective uh, a utility maximization, that has been, I, that even Savage, Jimmy Savage, who is known as the father of the modern decision theory, and he showed how to axiomize, axiomatize the uh, subjective probability and utility. Savage was very clear that his theory has a very limited domain that was lost with us. Savage said he knew the two big uh, yeah, uh, limits, which were uncertainty. So he gave in his book, uh, of 1954, an example is that planning a picnic is outside of the theory of <laughs> subjective maximization, maximization of subjective probability because something unexpected can happen. And mm. also, second example was chess. In chess, you know the state space, but you can't compute the optimal. Uh, Solution movies, yeah, because yeah. it's intractability. So, uncertainty and intractability are outside of subjective expected utility maximization. Mm. And what's often presented as the most general theory is, in fact, an extremely narrow theory, cannot deal with most situations in management, in planning, in, in everyday life. Just try to find the best partner for your life by expected utility maximization. Good luck. <laughs> we, 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 we love to be in control over everything, right? We, we, although we established that life is uncertainty in some manner, we, we don't love that. Our psyche doesn't love that. No. I like no. it. It would be boring <laughs> life if you would know everything. Come on. Because most people run away from it. That's how I feel. Because we we don't we don't we don't like to sit in that state of consciousness for long periods. No, it doesn't mean that we sit there. Uncertainty mm -hmm. is a challenge to develop mm -hmm. knowledge, to develop, to learn. Eh? There would be no learning in the world of risk. There's no learning. You know everything, all everything that can happen, all the consequences and the probabilities. Mm. That was human uh, life is about learning, about experience, about daring, yeah, about taking risks, trust other people, and all that would be gone if you could mm. predict the future with certainty. Mm. Uh I remember a quote Neil deGrasse Tyson said, he quoted like, if I could live up to eternity, why would I even get out of bed? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. People, people, there's a quote like, people who act don't often think that much and people who think often do not act that much. Is that true? Yeah, sometimes uh, sounds right, but uh, if you don't think at all, if you know nothing, mm -hmm. acting means you probably just imitate your peers, and mm -hmm. you do, it. Mm -hmm. or you just do the contrary of those whom you don't like. <laughs> there is no originality sprouting out. Yeah, originality is difficult because mm -hmm. that means 
you need to dare to think different from your peers. Mm -hmm. And originality is not always welcomed. Mm. As many people who had new ideas, even in science, you know, had to learn firsthand. Because we don't love uncertainty. Yeah, no people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it always has many reasons, but uh, the as we, if you look back in in humankind, though the dominant forces are beliefs, opinions, religion, even astrology, mm. and uh, or what the superiors tell us there's mm. lots of paternalism and uh, it has always been difficult for people who think hard to yeah to be uh, that the ideas are welcome to the rest that's almost as if we are saying against life right because we started with life as uncertain and yeah. we are saying people don't love some people being uncertain about their lives. Yeah, certainly uh, some people who don't like uncertainty and among mm -hmm. them are prominent economists. So <laughs> uh, give you one example. When Reinhard Selton, the economist, had his 80th birthday, he invited four speakers. And uh, there were two, three economists, two Nobel laureates, and myself. I'm the only non-economist. And I gave a talk on decision-making under uncertainty. Reinhardt, when I had finished after an hour, he said, you should have talked another hour. One of the Nobel laureates approached me and said, interesting, but you know, I don't like uncertainty. <laughs> It's there. There is still something that we we want to be in control over everything. You you studied psychology, so uh, does the brain crave for that? And crave to be in control over everything. Yeah, look, um, if you think that you are in a certain world, there is mm -hmm. nothing to be controlled on yeah? because everything is all you know everything already. It is uncertainty that requires to have some control as far as you can. But also, uh, one by acknowledging uncertainty, you don't run into the problem of an illusion of certainty and think yeah, that's, that you would know everything that happens. Mm. So, mm. The, uh, for instance, the mathematical models, the financial models, uh, who missed the, finance, the financial crisis of 2008 were models that are traditional models that assume that the world is stable. And you basically project what happened in the last 10 years into the future. In this way, you will miss every crisis. Hmm. Right. And even worse, you have a feeling of certainty. Hmm. Uh, you wrote a lot about the gut feeling and you even wrote a whole book about gut feeling and why it's such a huge measure in human life and in decision making. What is that gut feeling? Is it my second brain? And uh, how does that whole section operate? No, it's your, it's your brain. Yeah, there is no second <laughs> brain. Okay. Let's define it. Mm -hmm. A gut feeling or intuition mm -hmm. is a feeling that has three properties. First, it is based on year-long experience. So if you have no experience with a topic, you should not rely on your gut feelings. Mm -hmm. Second, it is quickly in your consciousness you feel that you should not do this or do this. 
And third, it, you can't explain it. So, uh, a gut feeling is not an arbitrary action. It is not a sixth sense, and it's not God's will. And it's also not something that only women have. We all <laughs> have uh, intuition, but only about issues where we have mm. long experience. Example, uh, if your doctor sees you and thinks today there's something different with you, but cannot explain what it is, this is an intuition or gut feeling that a doctor has. In the next moment, the doctor will then do diagnostics with you in order to find out what it is. So the example shows it is based on long year experience, it is quickly in consciousness, and you don't know why. Hmm. And it also shows that the there is no opposition between intuition and deliberate thinking. Both need themselves. In our example, intuition is first. And there would be no diagnostics if there wouldn't be an intuition first. Hmm. See, that, I... that means that the typical dual system theories that we have, so which are lists, just lists of oppositions, and they oppose uh, intuition against deliberate thinking. And uh, typically, in a way, that deliberate thinking is always superior, and intuition is not to be trusted. This right. is the wrong start. It's not about oppositions. It's about two different ways that work together it's interesting that you said that if we do not have information about a subject we shouldn't trust on our intuitions right why is that is our brain recording every second every moment is is it some is it lying there somewhere in our unconscious and we are not able to tap in it but this intuition or this unconscious goes through it, it, it ransacks through all this and gives you a result. Is, is that how it works? Uh, most of what your brain and your body is doing is unconscious. Hmm. Just imagine you would have to tell your stomach how to digest or during driving, huh, tell your, uh, your arms and legs and eyes what I exactly should do, and I would just cause accidents. So it is important. The unconscious is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to realize that and not look down at it. And there are two ways to learn intuition. One is to learn something consciously, like uh, playing piano. So you learn where to put your finger, with what timing. And, but music only starts when you don't know anymore what your fingers are doing. Mm. So I, in a, in a former career, before I went into science, I was a musician. Mm. And that's how you, I learned music. And there's a second way, which is different. You never learn anything deliberately but you learn it already implicitly or unconsciously. So you learn it by seeing. And that's the way, for instance, the, uh, uh, the I've worked with policemen uh, at the uh, international airports and who uh, try to identify drug couriers. So these are people who fly in with a, uh, a suitcase full of money and fly out a few hours later with the same suitcase with drugs. 
So how does a drug courier, how does a policeman identify the one drug courier in a crowd of hundred or several hundred people? Now, the, uh, the, when I interviewed uh, one of them, whose name is Dane Horan, uh, he said he doesn't know how he's doing, what he can do so well. And he learned it, not that someone pointed out, uh, uh, the cues, but he learned by walking with an experienced colleagues over years. And the experienced colleagues said, Dane, do you see this man over there? And at first, Dane Huran saw 20 men. And then he learned to see and to identify. So the only thing he could tell me how he identified in this case a woman who came in with a, a suitcase of $200,000 and uh, was that he is looking for someone who is looking for him. Okay. Okay. And if you have something to hide. And when their eyes crossed, so both right. knew what the other's business is. Right. How he does it, that's into it, intuition. Huh. That's a really interesting statement. What what you're looking is looking at you back. What are some heuristics that a, a common person can use in their everyday life? Okay. Um, you might observe yourself what the heuristics are that you use. That's the first thing. So, but there are numbers. So think about an everyday life situation like you in a restaurant and you want to order. Now, there are some people who try to optimize. That's not a heuristic. And they're going through the entire menu from the beginning to the end and read every word and somehow put utilities on that. And that's uh, uh, that, that would be the opposite of any heuristic. So what mm -hmm. heuristics are. So um, yesterday I was in, a, in an excellent restaurant. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good restaurant, I typically don't even open the menu, but I ask the waiter what she would eat here this evening. Mm -hmm. I don't ask her what she recommends. Mm -hmm. Because then she would think about, oh, this guy is German. Do we have anything German? And then you end up with something that is not... <laughs> recommendable, ask her what she eats, would eat here. And most of the time, this is really an excellent. Let's just take that. So another heuristic would be um, also don't open the menu, but uh, ask your friends, who is the one who has been here most often? And mm -hmm. if there's one, then just imitate what this guy orders. The third heuristic is now one where you open the menu, and that's called satisfying. So you think about a category, you had meat yesterday, or you're a vegetarian, you go for fish. And then you read the first item, salmon, yeah, okay, and also, and the second item, that uh, is something which you think, that's good. Then you stop and order it, and you don't even go on reading. This is very difficult for many people, because they think that could be something more interesting. But just think about if you would use satisfying for more important situations, like mm -hmm. finding a job or finding a partner for life, you would never end up with a decision because you always. Uh, so if you would optimize, Sorry, if you would optimize, you would always, you would never settle down with anything because there could be always something better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So these are some of the heuristics that you can try on uh, on an everyday basis. Yeah, about asking the waiter what 
they would choose uh, i read this quote from what you stated it's like when 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 you are with your doctor and your doctor says he is also uncertain asks the doctor what he would do if he was in your situation what's the difference there yeah. uh, from a for- formal educated suggestion and when you put your skin in the game yeah so you need to understand that uh, most doctors in most countries are forced to do defensive decision making that means they cannot recommend their patient the best thing because they uh, fear to be sued by the patient so they usually do too much and in other words defensive decision making means that the doctor does not recommend to the patient what the doctor recommends to his own family members they wouldn't sue <laughs> see so now in this situation you have to face that you get unnecessary uh, medication you get unnecessary uh, surgery or all kind of things that uh, are basically serve the doctor to protect him or herself from you as the potential plaintiff and in this situation if you understand that a good heuristic is not to ask the doctor uh, what he or she recommends but what he would do if it would be his brother or his son or his mother and i always have seen and you might try that you often get very different answers mm-hmm. so this is a type of heuristic which is a good idea in a certain environment like all heuristic and the environment is one of defensive decision making or here defensive mm-hmm. medicine and in the us studies show that over 90% of all doctors say that they do defensive medicine mm. that is that do not recommend the patient the best thing but primarily something that protects them from being sued mm. and it's not their fault it's the tort right. system that's such that's so much degrading for humanity because i have a friend who is a doctor who is a back in india uh, i have a friend he works in the government hospital and uh, it's one of the most uh, reputed hospitals and uh, he says the same thing he he wants to go abroad to uh, to have a higher career pers- perspectives but the freedom of a doctor is getting cut off and they don't want to move abroad because at at some point you have to rely on what you were telling exactly to get the most favorable outcome they do, they are afraid of this lawsuits and yeah. everything right. and 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 they know from they have that gut feeling that in, intuition from inside that this is not the most optimum solution but i think there is that uncertainty factor if something goes wrong and for that just one reason they don't want to migrate to other countries mm-hmm. right yeah. and 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 same applied for the case of the waiter because when when you ask the waiter what's your favorite dish and the difference is what you would do yeah. uh, even though there is nothing to be afraid there they still make very different decisions mm-hmm. uh, maybe it's a part of human psychology yeah and that's part of the study of heuristic decision making and the answer and you need to think about not only about something internal how you integrate information but also about the environment and herbert mm-hmm. simon used the analogy of a pair of scissors for that one okay. blade is cognition in your what's in your mind and the other is the environment mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. basically good decisions uh is uh good decisions make a uh, a match between the environment and the cognition and if the environment in our example is one like in the US that the tort law threatens the doctors then 
you have to fit that hmm? by, in our example, asking about what would you do if it would be your mother? Hmm? <laughs> For, for a common person to apply this, I think, again, going circling back, the heuristic there would be, if I know about the subject, then trust your gut sense, intuition more. Yeah, so you can only trust your intuition if you, if you have lots of experience. Inform me about the subject. So I, if you play chess over years, and the, the longer you play, the more experienced you are, the more you can trust your first impulse. Mm -hmm. And experienced and world-class chess players like Judy's Holia or a Magnus Person, they, uh, in interviews, they say that their big success is a mixture between intuition and deliberate thinking. Mm. And again, it's not an opposition. It's not that one is superior. And usually, okay. you need both. So, so you're saying that even when they are playing chess, there is, there are times when they use their rational brain and when they rely on their intuition. Of course, that's. Uh, I'm a researcher. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I would have, I would have no new idea if I would just do calculations. <laughs> uh, I need to have intuitions. And then check them. Hmm. And then find some faults. And then have new intuition. So the intuition drives you. And hmm. without intuition, there would be no innovation. What's happening physically in the brain when you when you're generating a intuition? If we would know that, that would be great. <laughs> What's the best guess right now? Uh, it is the uh, usually we have done some studies to uh, dissociate the process mm -hmm. of like the recognition heuristic uh, that you go with the similar option or the option that you recognize and pro uh, and dissociate that from the uh, the judgment about whether this is a good situation where you use a heuristic. And and that uh, you can read about these studies. The problem is that we, even if we can locate it, we don't know how it functions. Mm. It's a different mm. level. This is why we why we need to formulate the heuristics on a on a level that you know what to do. Mm -hmm. Like ask your doctor or. Uh, heuristics are uh, sequential, like take the best. You, you go one question, and if that doesn't help you, you go the next one and the next one. And uh, so the, the, the level where we understand heuristics is a behavioral level. Okay. So uh, taking out the scientist hat and putting on the philosopher hat, do you think there is any metaphysical aspect in cognition? or or is it something magical? Or where does your thoughts come from? Where do your thoughts come from? No. My thoughts come from the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And the recognition there is uncertainty. That means that the typical theories, like maximization of subjected uh, <clears throat> utility, the uh, they don't help you much here. And you need to study how experts and ordinary people make decisions under uncertainty. And then you're in the middle of a number of heuristics people use. And they're often mm. social, like imitation. Or sometimes they're not social. Mm. And that is... So I'm interesting, I'm always interested in how people make decisions. If you are in the uh, in the expected utility business, then most of the theories are as if, like Milton Friedman declared, we are not interested in how actual managers make decisions, but we just 
say that they make decision as if they would maximize something. Mm -hmm. That is not uh, my way. I'm not interested to have one kind of math and then claim that everyone that this describes or prescribes or is just as if or whatever the uh, status of the theory is. It's much more interesting to find out uh, what people are doing. How important is independent thinking? And uh, is it going up or down in this decade? Because there's so much information overload happening. We are living in the information era. And the newer generations that come up, they have more and more information to suck in per second, per se, when compared to the generation before. Yeah. Right. So in that thinking, in that sense, is independent thinking going up or down? It seems to me that thinking, not only independent, but thinking is more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. so if you have a device where you start to look for something and then scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and then post and wait for likes in the post and wait for likes and count likes and scroll and scroll and scroll. It is very difficult to think at all. And independent thinking is has always been difficult for most people because it, it, it means uh, you can be punished by your own friends for thinking differently. Hmm. So your question, uh, if you phrase it like that, does uh, technology uh, reduce thinking or independent thinking? I would say it is, it is more difficult to think than before. Because you, you're always busy and you are guided from outside. And the and social media are designed in order to keep you on the platform. That's what it is all about. Because mm -hmm. you don't pay. And the customers are the advertisers. And the advertisers want you to be as long as possible, even if you even if you regret it that you hadn't enough sleep or you wanted to do something else. It, your free will is no longer there. It's theirs. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And the uh, my, the the first thing that would be necessary is to change the business model of social media, so that people are allowed to pay for it, and then people are the customers and not the advertisers, and hmm. that would solve a number of problems of dependency of of uh, the the effects that we have, like uh, the, the increasing depression, which is probably to a considerable amount due to the technologies uh, that try to make people dependent mm. and not leave the platform, or if they leave it, uh, want to go back. So it's a little bit like smoking. Yeah, there is that basic heuristic in economics, right? Like, if it's free, then you are the product being sold. Right, yeah. yeah. I, I loved, uh, I was reading and I loved your comparison you made about social media, about that to that of a coffee shop. Imagine a coffee shop where the coffee is free. And so everybody in a town would uh, would go to that coffee shop where everything is free. But there is a catch. The coffee shop monitors everything you do, everything you speak to sell you stuff. I love that. Right. And you are not the customer. You mm. are the product. And the customer are, so and they call, in this coffee shop, there are many, many, many salespeople who constantly interrupt you and offer you personalized products. They are the customers. They pay for your coffee. And this analogy, uh, so this is a, roughly the situation you are if you're on social media. And it also shows you that there will be a solution. We mm. need the right back to pay for our coffee and become the customers 
and not the advertisers. Mm. And I made a, a, a simple calculation. Uh, how much would it be to, uh, how much would we have to pay every month to get our freedom back and be not monitored all the time? And uh, if you take Meta, so uh, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and so on, and then uh, in order to reimburse Zuckerberg for his entire revenue, so not the profit, but entire revenue, then uh, that would be about uh, for every use of Facebook, uh, sorry, of, of anything there, of Meta, every user would have to pay per month $2. That's a coffee. And that's not a huge cheap. price for freedom, isn't it? That's very cheap. But look, the problem is not only people like Zuckerberg or uh, Elon Musk who want to have the power hmm, to control us and to, to make us glued to their platforms and make their platforms the only place where can, we can meet hmm, because all the other coffee shops are bankrupt. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the, we, we would need to get our freedom back, our privacy back, and not because of two dollars a month. And the, these uh, immensely rich, mostly men, who reign our life now and run it, uh, they uh, are one problem. But there's another problem that's most of us, the users. So I have done a survey in Germany about <laughs> how much people would be willing to pay if they would become customers for all social media. And the social media would no longer try to find out whether you are depressive, you are pregnant, or have a, a, a serious disease. But leave us our privacy. So, and Germans are among those countries which have experienced states and governments that spied on them and used this information. So the Stasi, or earlier in Germany, the Nazis would have been, oh God, enthusiastic about having such a technology to change the mind of people and control them. and and steer the desires. So Germans should be among those who should be most willing to pay for their privacy. But no. When we ask them how much would you willing to pay? 75% uh, said nothing. And only 25% were willing to pay. And so we have a mixture between those who take away the privacy from you and get immensely rich and those users who don't want to pay for the privacy. When we ask the same users, what is it in the digital uh, world that makes you mostly uneasy, then they say, that my data, my personal data, is used and sold to third parties who somehow influence me, and I don't know why. And these are the same people who do not want to pay a single dollar for it. That's called the privacy paradox. Why is that? That's a good question. I think it's a kind of thoughtlessness. It's also uh, cheap if you complain about something, but you know, will, you're not willing to do something about it. And also, one should not underestimate how little 
digital natives know about the digital world. Then they know how to handle the device. Yeah. But for instance, um, colleagues of mine at Stanford University uh, tested over 3,000 uh, undergraduates and high school students and put them in front of a screen with a website. For instance, a website about a uh, uh, minimum wage. Should we have a minimum wage in the US? And ask the students, find out whether this website is trustworthy. Trustworthy means, is this, for instance, scientific? One from independent people who discuss, or is the behind it a PR agency who is being paid by someone to influence your opinion about minimum mm -hmm. wage? And actually, the website concluded that minimum wage is okay for Denmark, but not for the US. Okay. So, the point is, 96% uh, of digital natives had no idea how to find out whether they could trust this website. The wow. way they did it is they started on the top, read through it, and it sounded reasonable, and it and the website looked cool and thought it's trustworthy. Mm -hmm. The techniques that fact checkers use were unknown to them. One technique mm -hmm. is called lateral reading. So lateral reading means you only read a little bit until you know what this is about, and then you immediately leave the site and find out in about us whom they claim who is behind it, and then go on other sites and find out who is really behind that. In that mm -hmm. case, it was a PR agency that um, companies hired who didn't want to pay more wage than they paid. Yeah. Wow. It's a really complex topic. The reason for its relevance is because I was reading uh, normal human being in the digital world right now spends anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of his conscious waking hours looking at screens yeah and i think that right. clearly dictates the importance for these kind of discussions yeah. right because that's almost half of your life yeah and in my book how to stay smart in a smart world yeah, i i show some of these heuristics like lateral mm -hmm. reading is one. Another one is click restraint. Don't click at the first search result. <laughs> it's still about 50% of people think it's the most relevant one or the most popular one. No, neither. It's the one from which an algorithm thinks yeah, that, the, that the company can make most money. So the company huh. then is Facebook or Google. Huh? Um, I actually implied, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. I actually use such a kind of heuristics because when I, when it was Corona times and there was a lot of talk about the vaccines on both sides, uh, I used Google to know more about the vaccines. And then I used another browser, DuckDuckGo, and then I used a third one. Yeah. And, and I could see that there was a certain narrative push on the mainstream uh, search engines and you could see both sides on different search engines and and that's a really good way of thinking because that way you are not manipulated right yeah. and in and uh, another important point i wanted to add was that i was listening to Yuval Noah Harari he wrote this book called Sapiens he's a really good historian he works for the World Economic Forum and one in one of his talks he was saying that information is what rulers and governments and dictators always craved for if if our if the kings of the previous centuries had a situation like right now where they had access to this much information they would do anything for it anything they... yeah. yeah but that's nothing new what harari is telling mm -hmm. I, I i have a different opinion of harari He's certainly okay. not an excellent historian. Mm -hmm. No, 
I, I'm, I'm married to a historian, and historians would, <laughs> those I know, would never invite him. Uh, so you know so many stories. He's a popular writer, and also is a very naive, sorry, very naive uh, understanding of of, a, of AI, and mm -hmm, also mm -hmm. uh, a not very nice uh, view about humans. And he thinks and writes about it that we are a kind of bad primitive computers. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So, so um, what is his contradictions? What are his contradictions that you he, understood? Contradictions about him? So, so or the, his views? Sorry. Uh, he, he suggests all kind of things that have long been disproved, like uh, he, he suggests that uh, the prediction of the flu, so Google flu trends, Mm -hmm. in here, and uh, he knows better that it has been closed down because it doesn't work with big data. It works with one data point, with a simple heuristic, but he doesn't know about that. Uh, then there are all kinds of stories that he suggests that all, uh, uh, should say, how uh, that we soon will be, uh, there will be a kind of super intelligence around. There's no, there will be no super intelligence around. The deep neural networks, so artificial deep neural networks, are very different from the human mm. brain. And it is anthropomorphism if one thinks that they might think or anything like that. It's a statistical machine. And the real, the real amazing thing is that with pure statistics, like in generative uh, AI, you can produce results that are amazingly like humans' results. But it is not the same process, a totally different process. And you should not mm. confuse the end result with the process. It has nothing to do with human type of thinking. And you mm. can see this, for instance, when you... So I, I use a language where... Uh, uh, so ChatGPT doesn't have uh, many data points, and use a language where it has many data points, and then you use uh, some fact that is well known among the minority language, so, and okay. ask in the minority language about this fact, and ask in the in in English, for instance, about the same fact, and what you may find then is that you get two different answers in the two languages. Why? Mm. Because it predicts the most likely world, and in English it has lots of data. In the other language, it doesn't have the data, and it cannot think. A human mm. would know a fact in English also in the minority language. Mm. But that's not how chat, GPT, and similar systems work. They predict the next likely world in one length. It's interesting that you use the word it thinks. Yeah, it doesn't think. Uh -huh. Anthropomorphism is the greatest problem. And uh, mm -hmm. we see this all the time. And even smart minds like Jeffrey Hinton had mm -hmm. the, the idea that there might be soon a... Um, a super intelligence or another of his prediction, we won't need any radiologists anymore. He is now mm. retracted that prediction. There are more radiologists today. And there is a, uh, we always have had AI hypes. And uh, an AI can do some things much better than humans, particular if it's in a stable world, like predicting, uh, so playing chess, uh, playing Go, or having the entire corpus, like generative AI of a language does, and then predicting the next one. They can do this amazingly good. But when there's uncertainty, and when there's novelty, and uh, in then it, there are no great success stories that holds mm -hmm. for predicting the uh, COVID virus, the 
just the ordinary flu doesn't work. Uh, and human behavior, God is uh, predicting uh, in recidivism or uh, predicting policing, there is no evidence that this works better than in the minds of a smart and experienced policeman. So if we extrapolate that kind of thinking, AI would never get, a, get better than us? No. That's exactly not what I'm saying. AI oh, okay. is already better than us uh, in many games, in, okay. in situations which are stable. But uh, the kind of AI that we have, AI is not AI. The kind of AI that we're talking about are deep artificial neural networks. These are the moment. Uh, that is a statistical machine. And that will never mimic, I mean, never, never be able to, to think or to be intelligent like humans are intelligent. That doesn't preclude that there may be a breakthrough in software engineering that we cannot imagine with a very different kind of artificial intelligence. Nobody mm. will know about that, but uh, it won't be deep neural networks. Do you, do you feel that being married to your to a historian changed your world view in what sense did it open up the world to you how did you experience the world more in I, that sense I can only recommend to you to marry a historian <laughs> <laughs> my wife is a quite famous uh, historian of science her name is Lorraine Daston and she uh, I've learned lots about the history <laughs> And that mm -hmm. gives you a kind of humility about how difficult it is to foresee the future. Mm. And it just, you don't have to think far back. In the 1990s, uh, it was hard to imagine that uh, the internet would be something like we have, or social media, were just not there, or even further. Uh, if uh, if at the beginning of the twentieth century, you there are studies where people have been asked, experts, what will be at the end of the twentieth century? Nobody had computers in his or her mind. Mm. It was just faster planes. Faster cars, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so nobody had computers in their minds. Nobody had uh, had the internet in the mind or social media or any of these developments. And, it and it's getting yeah, and it's getting exponential because if you go like two, three generations back, uh, what? So there was this tradition of a family line going through with the same occupation right that's more or less because the world doesn't change that much what is in demand then was also in demand when the next generation came through but that's not the case now in every five years or even a half a decade yeah this is changing that's and true. the world is becoming that much more uncertain and again that's the relevance of your research there that is true but there are also parts of our societies which keep uh, within the family the business mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not only the British royal family who goes mm -hmm. but it's also some uh, big companies and who uh, who keep the companies in their own family but mm. you're right uh, it is it is no longer the age where if uh, if your father was a professor, you became a professor. If your father was a tailor, you became a tailor. It is much more changing. That is true. That is partially because the world is changing at a faster, uncertain rate, right? Or Yeah, and also professions disappear. Mm. Mm. And we uh, have a more freedom of movement, uh, physical movement, so moving in other countries. A social movement, we can move up 
that was not possible some centuries ago in many countries. And uh, so you, your only chance to, to get rich was to, to, to buy lotteries and hope. <laughs> and uh, there's more mobility, there's more of change, and also in that sense, more answer. Hmm. Do you have any heuristics in your thinking to get insights where you derive insights from? Also, read lots, but read the right mm-hmm. books. Okay. <laughs> How do we choose the right books? Yeah, that's How do you choose the right books? So, um, I read uh, the, I read lots of historians of science. Mm-hmm. I read, if mm-hmm. it's about decision theory, I, I read the basic books being written mm-hmm. by uh, Frank Knight, you know, so the classic risk, uncertainty, and profit. And I, um, I read a far, I read very broadly, and I avoid the popular books. Mm-hmm. Because they're mostly written by people who only have a half understanding, but are very charismatic in asserting that they know everything. Okay. And we have too many of these. So, uh, if you want my advice, read lots and read the right things. And also dare to form your own opinion and be aware that you are dependent on the opinion of your peers, but have the courage to stand up for the facts and not just for friendship. And sometimes Amazing. there's a conflict, but then we also have the chance to find different friends and with those who are also interested in understanding mm-hmm. the world, not just saying the same thing as their friends do. Mm. And that's, at the end, what you had asked before, independent thinking. And it's rare. So, dare to know. Love it. Love it. Let me ask the big question. What is the meaning of it all? What's the meaning of life? What have you understood from (laughs) your life? I have been happy to live during a time where there were no wars in my country. (laughs) And I had a chance. I started out, my my parents were rather poor, and I had a chance to learn, to go to the university, and I always appreciated that. And the, and the, what do you do with your life? There's one thing, you can use it to understand the world. And you can use it to uh, to have good friends and spend time with them and with your family. And above all, I think it's a duty to develop a critical mind. Hmm. And that requires to discuss lots. So I discuss with my students all the time. Hmm and to discuss openly so that everyone can contradict another one without being personally hurt, but an open atmosphere where everyone actually then can learn and understand. And uh, these kind of things are what you can do as a human being who came to earth it was not your idea and well at some time we all will disappear and we can use that time to do something good for us also to teach us to give interviews <laughs> and also to 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 acknowledge that we know uh, we will never understand everything that's around us where all the universe came from. And, but we can try. And there are so many good insights that uh, I have learned and also my own students taught. 
And that's a unique chance that we have to have the gift of living. Understanding, mm -hmm. thinking critically without getting cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, Jared. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and it was a pleasure. Yeah. expressing thoughts. And where are you located? Oh, I live in uh, live near to Toronto now, in Canada, Toronto. Ontario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is sort of like my hobby to mm -hmm. expand my consciousness and to hopefully inspire other people. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the digital media have, is this great opportunity huh, that mm -hmm. can be used huh, to spread ideas, to challenge our minds, food for our minds, huh, instead of influencing people to buy some products mm -hmm. or posting right. the great things that I eat or where I've been and so on. And that will be always a struggle humanity is with, a struggle between wisdom and all the rest. It's, it's getting even harder, I would say, because we are going in the direction of entertainment, the mainstream society, yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah don't let Again. the faith be yeah. entertained. <laughs> That's <laughs> maybe a good advice. <laughs> Because I know that's another intriguing part about the human psyche because we love to live in illusions more than reality. Yes, that's true. But that's called the uh, goal of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. To get people out, that every one of us gets out of the easy way uh, not to think, just to follow others and just to make themselves bigger and they, we haven't reached the enlightenment we are still in the middle ages <laughs> in order to know that requires courage lots of courage to know and stand up for what you know uh thank you so much dirt for having me and taking the time and uh where can people find you with your work Oh, you can uh, read some of my books. You find mm -hmm. them on Amazon. Uh, my last two books are How to Stay Smart in a Smart World. And there's a, even a newer one, which is called The Intelligence of Intuition. Mm. Mm? And you find them everywhere. Mm. And they're published which... in many languages, translated in many languages which every, everyone can practice and implement in their life. Thank you so much, Dirt. Bye-bye, It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And enjoy your dinner, rest of the day. And thanks for being the human that you are.